Hello everyone, Mr. Linder here. Let's talk about the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is a gland located just inferior to the larynx and is the largest pure endocrine gland of the body. What that means is that it's a gland that strictly produces uh, endocrine hormones. The follicular cells, so these cells right here, the follicular cells, are the cells that actually produce thyroid hormone. So this is where you get T3 and T4. The parafollicular cells, or also called the C cells, I mean this cell right here or this one right here, uh, these particular cells are the ones that produce calcitonin. Calcitonin uh, is a hormone that's actually used to decrease blood calcium levels. And so if you're going to decrease blood calcium levels, you're going to have to store that calcium uh, and that's going to happen in the bones. So calcitonin decreases uh, blood calcium levels. On the posterior side of the thyroid gland, so if you could view the back side of the thyroid gland, um, you actually would see uh, the, so if we could kind of look at the back of the thyroid gland, uh, you would actually see the parathyroid glands. Okay, so the parathyroids, which are their own glands, and the parathyroid glands uh, produce parathyroid hormone. Uh, and parathyroid hormone increases calcium levels. Uh, but those are glands to be discussed uh, at another time. What I want to focus on in this video is this idea of the uh, thyroid follicular cells um, and how they actually produce T3 and T4. And then what is the role of thyroid hormone? What are the functions of it? Uh, and then what is some of the pathology? So what we need to do is we need to actually zoom in on the thyroid gland and take a look at these follicular structures. Um, so what you're looking at in the thyroid here is actually a thyroid follicle. So this entire structure is a follicle. And so this would be a follicle and so forth. And the thyroid follicles are surrounded by these follicular cells. So we've got these follicular cells. And inside the thyroid follicle um, is this colloid material. So the inside has a colloid material. And so what I want to do is I want to zoom in on this. And so let's, uh, let's say, let's take a section of this, okay? And then let's zoom in on it in the next slide so we can take a look at what's going on. So in this particular diagram, what you're looking at is you're looking at the blood supply that's going to the thyroid gland. So here we have the a blood vessel and we have the blood supply. Then here we have the follicular cells. Okay, so this is a follicular cell. And this is a follicular cell. Okay, and these would go all the way around the follicle. And then this inner portion, of course, is the colloid material. And so what's going on here? Okay, and and what, what, is, what is the role of the thyroid gland and what is the role of the thyroid hormones? So thyroid hormones essentially have uh, long-term effects on metabolism. Uh, and they're really essential for normal growth uh, and development, especially in infants um, and children. Um, and so thyroid hormones um, are important uh, to be produced and released into the bloodstream so that they can go and affect cells uh, of the body um, and actually help us with our metabolism and our overall growth and development. When you study thyroid uh, hormones, you have to understand that thyroid hormones need iodine to be functional. And so there, there's a couple things to take a look at. First, you need the tyrosine uh, molecule. This is an amino acid. So we, we need the tyrosine amino acid uh, to produce thyroid hormone, but we also need iodine. And so you can see on the molecules here, this is the T4 molecule, and there are four iodines attached. One, two, three, four. And over here, this is the T3. And this is the T3 thyroid hormone with one, two, three iodines. Uh, but notice there a modification of this tyrosine amino acid. 
So we need to somehow uh, get iodine into the thyroid gland, and then we need to have a mechanism uh, for actually producing uh, the T3 and T4 uh, hormone. So synthesis of the thyroid hormones is going to take place in these thyroid uh, follicles. And these thyroid follicles actually have this material called thyroglobulin that is part of this internal structure called the colloid. And this thyroglobulin material actually has those tyrosine uh, amino acids associated with it. Um, the follicular cells are actually producing the thyroglobulin and the enzymes necessary for producing T3 and T4. So this thyroglobulin production and enzymatic production uh, is actually taking place in the follicular cells and then it's being exocytosed. So you can see the exocytosis taking place that's gonna put that thyroglobulin and the necessary enzymes in the colloid so that T3 and T4 production uh, can actually take place. So let's take a look at what's uh, going on here in the thyroid follicles so that we can produce T3 and T4. So the first thing uh, to, to make note of is the fact that thyroglobulin and enzymes are being packaged inside of vesicles uh, and then they're being exocytosed uh, into the colloid material. So we're taking this, this, uh, these enzymes and this thyroglobulin, these essentially tyrosine amino acids that are linked together, and we're dumping them by exocytosis uh, into the colloid material. Then what the follicular cells are gonna do is they're gonna actively transport iodide. So iodide is the anion, iodide, is the anion, meaning negatively charged, uh, version of iodine. And so iodide uh, is actually coming from our diet. So you, you oftentimes uh, will consume iodized salts. So when you season your food and you're using sodium chloride to season your food, uh, iodide uh, has been added to it. And so these iodized uh, salts uh, are consumed in our diet. And so we get that iodide into our bloodstream from the digestive system. And so what we're doing here is we're actively transporting the iodide from the blood and using um, sodium as a symport mechanism. So here we have sodium and iodide coming into the follicular cells uh, so that we can get that iodide into uh, the follicle cells. Once the iodide is in the follicle cell, it's going to move through the follicular cell and then it's going to be transported by a protein called pendrin. And pendrin is going to transport that iodide into the colloid material. So you're going to have all these negatively charged iodides okay, in the colloid along with the thyroglobulin and enzymes that were dumped by exocytosis from the follicular cell. So we've got thyroglobulin, which is containing our amino acid tyrosine. We've got the iodide now inside the colloid material. We just have to figure out a way to put these pieces together to produce thyroid hormone. So one of the things that has to happen is there has to be enzymatic um, uh, activity in order to convert the iodide into iodine. So there's an enzyme called thyroid peroxidase and thyroid peroxidase is going to take the negatively charged iodide and it's going to convert it into iodine. So here we have iodine uh, now inside the colloid material. So thyroid peroxidase is allowing us to produce the iodine, and then the iodine can be added to the tyrosine that's found on the thyroglobulin. So thyroid peroxidase, I'll just put TP here for the enzyme, thyroid peroxidase is not only helping us to produce the iodine, okay, but it's also helping us to attach the iodine to the tyrosine. So when you have one iodine attached to a tyrosine, you produce a molecule called MIT. So MIT, okay, the legend here actually will help you. 
So MIT means you have one <clears throat> iodine attached. Okay, mono iodotyrosine, mono meaning one. If you take an MIT and then add another iodine to it, you can get a molecule called DIT. That means you have two iodines attached to it. And then we can couple these molecules together to produce the T3 and the T4 molecules. So if you take an MIT and a DIT and you link those together, well, one molecule has one iodine, the other one has two iodines. So when you link those together, you get the T3 thyroid hormone. If you take two DITs and link them together enzymatically, you can get the T4 thyroid hormone. And so this is how we produce T3 and T4 hormone. We move the tyrosine into the colloid. We move the iodide into the colloid. We create the iodine. We attach the iodine to tyrosine to produce MIT. Then we add another iodine to create DIT, and then we link them together. MIT and DIT to form T3, two DITs together to produce T4. Once you have created the T3 and T4, really what you've done is you've created about a two to three month supply. There's about a two to three month supply of T3 and T4 inside the colloid of the follicles of the thyroid gland. So then what happens is we need to stimulate the thyroid gland in order to endocytose that thyroglobulin back into the follicular cells. So in order to do that, we use the hormone TSH. So TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which is an anterior pituitary hormone, TSH comes along, stimulates the thyroid gland, and it actually is triggering these follicular cells to endocytose, right? So we're going to bring material, right? We're going to endocytose from the colloid, and we're going to bring material back into the follicular cell. And what that's doing is that's bringing this now newly created T3s and T4s into the follicular cells so that enzymes can separate the T3 and T4 from it. So if we follow the arrows here, we're going to separate the T3 and the T4, the thyroid hormone, from the endocytosed material so that eventually we can dump the T3 and T4 into the bloodstream. So the T3 and T4 is going to get to the edge of the follicular cells, and we're going to have uh, transporters here. Uh, essentially, these are uh, what we call monocarboxylate transporters. And the monocarboxylate transporter is going to take the T3 and the T4, and it's going to move it from the follicular cell out into the bloodstream. So we're essentially transporting thyroid hormone, the two versions of it here. So this is thyroid hormone, T3 and T4. Okay, we're dumping them into the blood so that they can circulate around to our body cells. Uh, once the thyroid hormone is in the bloodstream, it's actually going to attach to something called thyroid binding globulin. So there's a transport protein in the blood. It's called TBG, thyroid binding globulin. That's going to grab onto the T3 and T4, and that's going to move the T3 and T4 uh, to the target cells. Um, once T3 and T4 gets to the target cells, uh, T3 is the active version of thyroid hormone. So any T4 that enters the cells will have an uh, iodine removed to become T3, uh, and then those will interact with receptors inside of the cell, and they will go on to affect uh, genetic um, a, a gene expression, and so you'll have transcription and translation take place within the target cells, and then we can go on to affect uh, metabolism. Um, the pathway for controlling all of this um, is a hypothalamic 
uh, pituitary thyroid gland access. And so here we have the hypothalamus uh, producing thyroid releasing hormone. Thyroid releasing hormone uses that hypophyseal portal system to trigger the release of thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, thyroid stimulating hormone then has its trophic effects on the thyroid gland. And so if there's more TSH, you have hypertrophy. And if there's less TSH, you'd have atrophy of the gland. And so uh, the thyroid gland is stimulated. And then we went through the process of producing T3 and T4 and that's being dumped into the bloodstream and circulating through the body. T3 and T4 has negative feedback effects to control the levels within the body. So it's a normal uh, negative feedback type system. The functions of T3, because again, T3 is the active version uh, of thyroid hormone, uh, is that T3 is thermogenic, meaning that basically um, it increases the utilization of oxygen within uh, most tissues of the body. And so when we are utilizing oxygen and we're uh, producing uh, ATP through metabolic activities, uh, of course we generate heat as a byproduct and so T3 has a thermogenic effect. Uh, T3 increases the consumption uh, of glucose uh, and fatty acids. So again, we're utilizing resources to produce ATP. It essentially, uh, T3 affects the activity of metabolic enzymes so that we can run things like glycolysis and the citric acid cycle um, and electron transport chain and so forth for ATP production. Um, Thyroid hormone affects uh, protein catabolism, so we can uh, break down uh, proteins, um, utilize them for resources. In children, though, we see more of an anabolic effect. And so uh, in infants and children, we see the, uh, the, the thyroid uh, hormone um, assisting uh, growth hormone in development of bones, in development of muscle, uh, and just overall tissue uh, growth in the body, uh, and, and especially uh, nervous tissue as well. So thyroid hormone is vitally important uh, in our growth and development of our brain and our spinal cord uh, so that we can uh, have a thriving, functioning nervous system. As far as pathologies go, we talk a lot about the idea of hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Um, and, and there's different examples of each of these. So hypothyroidism would be a decreased amount of T3. Um, hyperthyroidism would be an increased amount. Uh, one of the, the best examples of hypothyroidism um, is iodine deficiency. And so we need uh, the iodide molecule to be transported into the colloid. And so without that uh, anion, we're not going to produce adequate amounts of T3 and T4. And so without the iodine, um, it leads to hypothyroidism. Um, hypothyroidism can lead to what's known as a goiter. And so I want to show you a, a different diagram on, on what this might look like. So the normal pathway is thyroid releasing hormone, TSH, and then produce T3 and T4. And if that's happening, then we have normal functioning thyroid gland and we have our normal negative feedback system and everything is doing what it's supposed to be doing. But if you have inadequate amounts of iodine, then you're gonna have low levels of T3 and T4. When you have low levels of T3, and of course T4, but when you have low levels of thyroid hormone, you lose that negative feedback system. Okay, so you lose the negative feedback that you rely on to control your TRH and TSH levels. And so when you don't have that negative feedback, you're gonna see an increased amount of thyroid stimulating hormone. And because it has that trophic effect on the gland, the gland is going to hypertrophy. It's basically stimulating the gland and it's telling the cells right, of the thyroid gland, hey, you need to make more T3 and T4. Well, the problem is there's no iodine right, or no iodide right, in the blood to be transported in to be used to make the T3 and T4. So the gland keeps getting bigger and bigger because it thinks it needs to produce 
more right colloid material so that it can produce more T3 and T4, but it doesn't have the iodine to do it. And so what you end up with is this growth of the thyroid gland. And so you get uh, what we refer to as a goiter. And so what you can see here in this patient here is the enlarged thyroid gland. And so it's making uh, the neck bulge out and that's known as a goiter. So a goiter is this abnormal growth of the thyroid gland. And it's typically due to the inefficient iodine. And so you can't produce the T3 and T4. And so you lose the negative feedback uh, system. And so without the negative feedback, thyroid stimulating hormone is able to come along and constantly activate the gland and it makes the gland get bigger and bigger and bigger. So you get that hypertrophy. Um, hyperthyroidism can also though cause goiters and, and we'll come back and talk about some other examples of hypothyroidism as well, but hyperthyroidism can also cause a goiter. Uh, there's a condition known as Graves disease. Uh, Graves disease is an autoimmune disease uh, where we actually uh, produce thyroid stimulating uh, immunoglobulins or thyroid stimulating antibodies. Uh, and what these antibodies are doing is they are acting like TSH. So it's not TSH itself, it's not coming from the anterior pituitary, it's these thyroid stimulating antibodies that are having a positive impact on the thyroid gland and causing it to hypertrophy. So the gland hypertrophies and we get an increase in T3 and T4 production. So there is negative feedback taking place. And so we're seeing a reduction in TRH and a reduction in TSH, but that's not shutting off the gland because the gland is being stimulated by an outside source. So this Graves disease and these productions of these antibodies, those antibodies acting like TSH causing the gland to enlarge and produce more thyroid hormone and more thyroid hormone. So in this case, you're getting hyperthyroid conditions, whereas in the iodine deficiency, you're getting hypothyroid uh, symptoms. So what are some of the signs and symptoms then for hyper and hypothyroidism? So jump ahead here. In Hyperthyroidism, the one we were just talking about, so think Graves' disease. In hyperthyroidism, you're seeing things like exophthalmus, which is the bulging eyes. Um, and I'll go back to that picture in a minute. Um, increased oxygen consumption, um, metabolic heat, so increased heat for the body, muscle weakness, protein catabolism, weight loss, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, uh, increased blood pressure. So an overall nervousness or nervous state of the body. So that's this hyperthyroid type symptoms. In hypothyroidism, you're seeing kind of the opposite of things. You're seeing lethargic conditions, slowed growth, um, intolerance to cold, um, hair gets brittle, nails are brittle, um, kind of a sluggishness, a depression, an apathy, uh, fatigue, sometimes weight gain. So those are hypothyroid uh, type conditions. So for a hypothyroid, you want to think about things like iodine deficiency. Um, there's a more advanced hypothyroid uh, condition known as myxedema. So... Myxedema is a very advanced uh, hypothyroid condition where oftentimes it's not being treated properly. There's another hypothyroid one called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you're looking at another type of autoimmune condition. <clears throat> so it's autoimmune, um, like Graves' disease is autoimmune. Only in Graves' disease, we saw hyperthyroid, and in Hashimoto's, we have hypothyroid uh, conditions. Um, thyroidectomies, where you have the thyroid gland removed, that would be a hypothyroid condition as well. Um, in the myxedema condition, what you'll notice with that one is you'll see um, accumulation 
uh, of uh, fluids, um, mucoproteins, mucopolysaccharides in tissue spaces of the body that can cause edema that takes place. And so I want to show you um, a picture of that. Uh, so in this particular patient, this is uh, myxedema, hypothyroid condition, but the myxedema that they want you to make note of is under the eyes here. So you see the bags under the eyes. Um, that can be a sign of hypothyroidism. So even though this particular patient uh, doesn't show the weight gain associated with hypothyroidism, you can see the myxedema uh, that is associated with it. Um, in a hyperthyroid situation, let me go back here, in hyperthyroid, uh, what you'll see is sometimes this exophthalmus condition, uh, so the bulging eyes. So as there's accumulation of uh, fluids uh, behind the eyeballs, it can cause the, the uh, eye uh, to bulge forward. So again, it's this deposition of uh, mucopolysaccharides and mucoproteins uh, in the bony orbit that's causing the eyes uh, to bulge forward. And so you see that in hyperthyroid conditions. So exophthalmus for hyperthyroid, myxedema for hypothyroid. Goiters, though, happen in both. So you can't uh, look at a goiter and know exactly if it's hypo or hyper. Uh, the last uh, hypothyroidism that I want to make note of is the one uh, that's seen in infants. Uh, so in this particular diagram, what you're looking at is a, is a situation where you're looking at an infant uh, that definitely doesn't have the normal uh, facial expressions uh, that you would expect from an infant. And so that's usually telling you that there is some sort of central nervous system deficiency. And in this case, uh, the deficiency uh, is being caused by hypothyroidism. Uh, so this is known as cretinism, um, and it's hypothyroidism that actually can start uh, in the first trimester of pregnancy, uh, and if that hypothyroidism progresses uh, after birth and isn't treated uh, in really the first month, uh, but I would say up to about six months uh, of postnatal development, then you're going to see some permanent deficiencies uh, in the child. And so hypothyroidism uh, should be tested for at birth, and it, it can be treated uh, early on uh, postnatally uh, to ensure that the, uh, the proper amounts of T3 are available to the infant so that normal nervous system development takes place, as well as muscle and bone development uh, alongside growth hormone. So there's a lot of, of synergism that needs to take place between the hormones in order for proper development to take place. So that's a little bit on some clinical pathologies for thyroid hormone. I hope that helps. Take care.